The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Jane Hutchin. This is Ear to Asia. There have been expressions of contrition by Japanese political leaders, even prime ministers, but because it tended to change in tone or intensity uh, with change in Japanese politics, as well as Japanese civil society, that it appears to be inconsistent and maybe not sincere from the perspective of most Koreans. There isn't the resistance perhaps on the part of many young people in Taiwan to Japanese popular culture that you sometimes can find in Korea and in the Chinese mainland where enjoyment of things that come from Japan are seen as part and parcel of surrendering to Japanese colonization. In this episode, contrasting memories of Japanese colonization in Korea and Taiwan. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. Taiwan and Korea were both colonized by Imperial Japan for much of the first half of the 20th century, liberated only after Japan surrendered to Allied forces in 1945. The Korean peninsula was subsequently cut into two, but as different as North and South Korea are today, they continue to share a deep resentment or even animosity towards Japan over their treatment during the colonial period. Yet in Taiwan, which in fact endured an even longer colonial presence, there seems to be a more positive and even appreciative attitude towards their former coloniser. While public monuments in South Korea typically memorialise women forced into sex slavery by the Japanese military, those found in Taiwan tend to honour the contribution of the Japanese in developing the island. Polling suggests a similar sentimental divide among ordinary people in the two former colonies. So why is there such a stark difference in attitude towards Japan in these political entities? How have their respective education systems and media sustained or modified these attitudes? And what present-day political ends do these differing narratives serve? Joining me to examine the ongoing impact of Japanese colonization in the Koreas and Taiwan are Korea historian Professor Kyung Moon Hwang from the Australian National University and Asia historian Dr. Louis Mayo from Asia Institute. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Kyung Moon. Welcome back, Louis. Thank you. Hello, Jane. So I want to do a little mini history lesson with our experts. First of all, briefly describe how and when Korea was colonized by Japan, Kyung Moon. The colonization began in 1910 formally, although the process began in 1904, 1905 with the Russo-Japanese War, when the Japanese soldiers encamped in Korea to prosecute the war against Russia. And there had been imperialist pressures from Russia and Japan, as well as China, since the late 19th century, but the actual colonization formally began with the annexation in 1910 and continued until 1945. Right. And Taiwan, Lewis? So Taiwan was Japan's first external colony of the modern era, and it was ceded by the Qing dynasty, the imperial structure ruling on the Chinese mainland in 1895 to Japan as a result of Japan's defeat of the Qing in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, to which was actually partly fought over disputes between the rising power of Japan and the old power of the Qing dynasty over control of Korea. So Taiwan, which had become a Chinese populated area during the Qing dynasty, that is in the period prior to the 17th century, so the Qing dynasty is established in 1644, the people living on Taiwan were overwhelmingly people who spoke Austronesian languages. And Austronesian languages are the languages that dominate in the Philippines, in Indonesia, 
in most of the Pacific and in Madagascar. And so historically, that territory was transformed in the run-up to Japanese colonialism by becoming a Chinese space. So in that sense, it's quite a different setting from Korea. And give us the dates of the actual colonization. So the colonization runs from 1895 and runs to 1945. So that's different from the Korean period where you have 1910 formal colonization through to 1945. So a 50-year span in the case of Taiwan. So both Taiwan and Korea were colonies of Imperial Japan for much of the first half of the 20th century and were liberated shortly after Japan surrendered at the end of the Second World War in 1945. To get this discussion started, Hyung Moon, it's a common view that in South Korea there's a lingering resentment towards Japan over its treatment during the colonial period. But is that an oversimplification? No, I think it works as an oversimplification, although, of course, there's a lot more to it when you dig beneath the top layer of this supposed uniform perspective, which I think can be described as resentment, um, bitterness to a certain extent. And uh, it's justifiable, of course, as is all colonial experiences around the world, that you would have this lingering hostility built on resentment from the historical uh, pains and injustices from that period. But if you do look underneath that layer, of the supposed uniformity of sentiment. I think there's a lot of interesting differentiation depending on what groups of people you're talking about and for what purposes uh, the voices are being expressed. So give us maybe two divergent views. Among historians, let's say, there are more than two divergent views, but the main one is the one that splits the perspective focusing on the oppression of the colonial rule and the Korean resistance to that, or the in these cases, often there was the Korean cooperation, uh, which is called, of course, a traitor's cooperation as well. And so that's on the one side, which is a more traditional perspective. On the other side are historians who look at the colonial period uh, in a more expansive fashion and consider different factors that went into how the colonial experience contributed to the further development and modernization of Korea, whether it was ultimately good for Korea politically or not. And you've spoken about those views being those of historians like yourself. What about the broad community? Are there similar divergences? No, I don't think to that extent, although you can certainly access broader and more divergent views these days with the availability of information and views expressed through YouTube. Um, YouTube is a huge thing in South Korea. There are all kinds of different voices have their own channels for whatever they want to say, including on the history of South Korea, the history of Korea as a modern nation, including, of course, the history of the Japanese colonial period. And there you can go off on all kinds of tangents, and there are very uh, interesting extremes expressed as well, from ultra-nationalist to ultra-pro-Japanese, ultra-accommodationist in trying to look at Japanese colonial rule as being something much more than just simply oppression. Lewis, in Taiwan, the common view is that the Taiwanese attitude towards its former coloniser is more positive, possibly even appreciative. Is that accurate? Well, I would follow Kyung Moon in saying that, in a sense, the picture is more complex than that. I would say that the heritage of struggle against outside control is essential to the narrative of what I would call Taiwan independence nationalism. And that is the form of nationalism that one finds in Taiwan. And I think it's legitimate to call it a form of nationalism because it argues that Taiwan is an autonomous entity entitled to self-government and that Taiwan's history is a distinct history of its own, separate from the history of any other structure, and that includes both the Chinese mainland and colonial Japan, that one element in that narrative is this story that Taiwan's people and peoples have been engaged in ongoing resistance. So moments of rebellion against Japanese rule 
in Taiwan are celebrated both by uh, the Taiwan independence nationalists and by those who advocate unification between Taiwan and the Chinese mainland. So uh, if you look at the way in which mainland Chinese interests and voices construct the history of Taiwan's colonization by Japan, there's emphasis on the struggle of people deemed to be Chinese and patriotically Chinese against a foreign colonizer, i.e. Japan. But there's another narrative, which is from those who argue that Taiwan is a separate entity, that there is a history of resistance, but that part of what makes Taiwan's history distinctive is that period of experience with Japanese colonialism. And built into that is a narrative that Taiwan's modernization was effected to a very large extent by Japanese colonial rule in collaboration with local Taiwan interests. So I need to get clear here that much of what is said about the Japanese colonial period is framed by debates over whether or not Taiwan is part of China. So those advocating the idea that Taiwan and China are one entity, that Taiwan is a province of a thing called China, insist that it is Japanese colonization that has made Taiwan people think of themselves as independent. But on the other hand, those who argue that Taiwan is a separate entity with its own structure acknowledge the presence and importance of the colonial phase in Taiwan's history, but they don't necessarily advocate either a position of unification with Japan or a kind of embrace of the colonial era. I mean, I think it's in some ways similar to those in Hong Kong who would say, well, we feel different because we lived with British colonial domination. Doesn't make us subservient to Britain or people who think of ourselves as British, but that's part of our history. And I think it's a similar position can be argued in the case of Taiwan. I'd just like to bring in a little bit of Korea's history at this stage, if I may. What was Korea like on the eve of colonization, Kyung Moon? Politically, Korea had been ruled by a single dynastic family since the late 14th century. Um, there actually is currently a transition going on in terms of how to periodize the Joseon dynasty uh, that ensued, whether it ended in 1897 or it ended in 1910 with Japanese colonization. Traditionally, it had been 1910 that was designated the closing point of the Joseon dynasty. But in 1897, the Joseon dynasty turned into an empire, the Great Korean Empire, as it was called. And it was ruled by the same reigning family, but it was supposed to have been an expression of the Korean sense of independence in the modernized system of nation states. And so, uh, this was a very transitional moment in the turn of the 20th century, and it was dominated by the foreign influences and, in some cases, of course, foreign exploitation. And those dynamic changes were begun before Japanese colonization actually worked very much in development when Japanese colonization began in 1910. What kind of dynamic changes? Well, the most interesting, perhaps, are the changes taking place in the economy with commerce and infrastructure, seeing a lot of major developments, the first railroads, streetcars, the urbanization of Seoul and some other metropolitan areas, changes in daily life as well. And of course, concomitant with that, uh, the strengthening of a sense of national identity, particularly in the face of imperialist pressures. And how did the Japanese treat the inhabitants of Korea? Well, that's a very complicated question. In terms of seeing Koreans as capable of ruling themselves, the Japanese tended to see that, of course, as being not possible. And the Japanese convinced themselves, and when I say the Japanese, I'm talking about the Japanese government and the ruling elites, that the Koreans have demonstrated that they could not properly rule themselves or modernize their own country to the extent that they could defend themselves against other imperialist powers, not Japan, but Russia, China, and others as well. And so the Japanese turned this into a narrative of security 
interests and how they saw the weakness uh, on the part of the Korean government, especially as well as Korean elites and the Korean society and culture as a whole, as being incapable of resisting imperialist pressures, uh, and that would lead to a security threat to Japan. So that was the narrative that was crafted to legitimize the Japanese takeover. Lewis, what about Taiwan's experience of colonialization? What was the relationship between uh, the colonizer and the, the people? So in contrast to Korea, we're not talking about the displacement of a long-established sovereign traditional state and government, but rather of the annexation of a frontier territory, which had a population of migrant settlers who had taken over that territory in the two centuries prior to the colonization by Japan in 1895. And so you have, as with Korea, a narrative of inferiority of the local population And this is a story not of state deemed backward and incapable of modernizing as a state, but of an area that was regarded as populated essentially by a rabble, so to speak. This is not a site where Japanese colonization encounters a long established Chinese cultural structure to which Japan had in the centuries prior to modernization looked up but rather something much rougher. And so there's a narrative of, yes, Taiwan needs to be modernised, needs to be brought forward, but not in the sense of bringing a quote-unquote feudal kingdom into the modern world, as in the case of Korea, but rather taking a rough colonial territory and civilising it. I'd like now to talk about the period from the Second Sino-Japanese War, 1937 to 1945, and Japan's military expansion into Asia. The impact on Japan's colonies was huge, and they included forced conscription into the military, forced labour and sex slavery. Of course, Korea and Taiwan weren't the only Asian country that women were taken from. I wonder if you could both comment on the effects of that military expansionism and whether they were experienced to the same degree in both your places of expertise. Lewis, perhaps you can go first. Well, this is an interesting question because between 1937 and 1945, the Japanese government undertook a process of comprehensive imperialization, it's called, but literally emperorization. And one of the things you could say, which is to say people should take up Japanese as the language that they spoke rather than Hokkien or Hakka, the dominant Chinese languages in Taiwan at that stage. So these are languages quite different from Mandarin, the standard language of the Chinese uh, nation state of the present era. And that learning Japanese would enable the Taiwan population to be granted equal status within the empire by proving loyalty, proving involvement with this Japanese structure, the Taiwan population could achieve a measure of parity within the empire. And this is quite a complex question, because on the one hand, you could argue that those who had known nothing but colonial Japan, uh, colonial Japanese rule in Taiwan, and of course, that means anyone born after the 1890s, and that means people in middle age and people who were perhaps in their 20s, their sense of place in the world was perhaps partly informed by the idea that, well, they were candidates for membership in an imperial structure. There are two ways of thinking about a parallel with that. One is to say, well, why did white Australians and white New Zealanders join the First World War with such enthusiasm in the early part of the 20th century? That's because, you know, it's argued that, well, proving that you were part of Britain was a way in which you established a status for yourself within the imperial structure. But another parallel would be the Japanese Americans who fought with the American forces in Germany, who were hoping to overcome their second class status within the American structure by proving their loyalty to the American state. So while you have coercion in a colonial structure, 
one of the things that people often emphasize is that the Taiwan participation in the war effort was less coerced, perhaps, than one might expect of a colonized people. Kyung Moon, talk to us about the Korean experience. It seems from what many of us have read that that would be quite different to what happened in Taiwan. I think to a certain extent it is quite different. At a fundamental level, what Lewis just talked about in terms of the policy of wartime mobilization as engendering a transition in the mindset of the subject colonized peoples with these slogans of transformation into imperial subjecthood. That was the same in the wartime period of World War II in Korea as it was in Taiwan. I think the intensity of that mobilization did reach levels of what we would normally consider atrocities. And, you know, we used the term sexual slavery uh, a lot, but that might not be the most accurate term. It was just as terrible, but if you can simplify things, it was uh, a mobilization of of young girls or young women into the militarized prostitution system. So that's one of the atrocities. The others are, of course, commonly known as the conscription system, which actually didn't become a forced conscription until the last two years in Korea, and uh, the mass mobilization of labor, which became in some parts a coercive labor system as well. So all these things happened in the last five to seven years of the colonial period in Korea. And what is most interesting is that the terribleness of that experience in which the entire colony was mobilized and all kinds of material goods were appropriated for the war cause. That was so terrible that it was easy for the Koreans to use that experience as really uh, the representation of the entire colonial experience of 35 years. Uh, And that has had, of course, uh, significant repercussions in the way the Koreans remember the entire colonial period. Kian Moon, I wondered whether the lingering animosity towards Japan related to a perceived lack of real kind of reconciliation and contrition on the part of the Japanese government. Yeah, so that also is is not as uh, straightforward as it seems. Uh, There have been um, expressions of contrition by Japanese political leaders, even prime ministers uh, since the 1970s, certainly the 80s, uh, off and on. And I note actually that these statements continue up to very recent times. Right. So it often depends on who is the prime minister of Japan, you know, what party or what faction of the LDP is represented by the prime minister. So there have been ups and downs in terms of the level of contrition expressed for either the colonial period as a whole, uh, the colonial rule, or more specifically, the comfort women or other things as well. It's just that because it tended to change in tone or intensity uh, with the waves of change in Japanese politics, as well as developments within Japanese civil society, that it appears to be inconsistent and maybe not sincere from the perspective of, uh, I think, most Koreans. And so that has created this vacuum in which Korean sentiment uh, regarding Japan, based on the colonial experience, has filled in with ever greater expressions of hostility and demands for more contrition or firmer commitments to recognizing what happened and to compensate the victims. Some of them are still alive, including forced laborers or mobilized laborers, and even a few comfort women as well. I want to ask you both. Let's start with you, Lewis. Were Japanese colonizers met with resistance and what forms did that take? So resistance was a complex process through the colonial period in Taiwan. The initial annexation of Taiwan by Japan in the 1890s through to the early 1900s was an extremely bloody affair in which a complex of agendas were pursued by the local elite groups, who, as I say, we could think of as a kind of local gentry society, who did not want to see this incoming structure take over. We're talking about a society that was relatively stable at the time that colonization happened, but which had a long history of volatility and rebellion. And the pacification of that population by Japan was, as I say, violent and very difficult. You have, of course, the extra 
complexity in the Taiwan case that the colonizing power is not simply pacifying the dominated majority of the local area, but is also involved in continuing the process of encroachment on the lands of the indigenous population, the Austronesian speakers. And so the Japanese state expands violently into Aboriginal territories in ways that are very similar to the processes of the expansion of the colonial state in Australia into the territories of Australian Indigenous people. Uh, It's really a very, very similar process. But as the colonial period wears on, you get a mixture of leftist resistance to Japanese imperialist economic structures. You have people who are affiliating themselves with the cause of Chinese revolutionary nationalism on the mainland. And of course, after 1911, the Qing dynasty, which had ruled Taiwan, is overthrown and is replaced by a radical nationalist anti-colonial government, which is you know, part of trying to establish a Chinese republic on the Chinese mainland. There are people who are sympathized with that. And then you also have, I guess, what you would call autonomy or self-government leaders in the local group who are agitating for greater rights within the colonial empire. The Taiwan has a whole cluster of different forms of resistance and accommodation through the period of uh, the 50 years of Japanese colonial rule, and they change in kind as the years move on. What about specifically during that period, 37 to 45? So 37 to 45, I guess you see Taiwan being subjected to the same fascist structures that are imposed upon Japan itself, So a fascist mobilization of a population by a right-wing military-dominated government uh, with emperor worship being placed at the center of this right-wing conception of the empire as an entity. But the added complexity, of course, for the Taiwan population is that that period from 1937 to 1945 is the time of Japan's war with the Republic of China. So people who are co-ethnics, one might argue, in the sense of being people who are part of the ethno-national structure that we would call China or Chinese, uh, that is the target for Japan's military action through this period. So you're essentially asking the Taiwan population to identify with Japan and not to conceptualize itself as having any meaningful relationship with the land from which the majority of that population had migrated. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Jane Hutchin, and I'm joined by Asia historian Dr. Louis Mayo and Korea historian Professor Kyung Moon Huang. We're looking at the different experiences of Taiwan and Korea under Japanese colonization and how they've shaped views towards Japan today. And before we move on to the post colonial period, Kyung Moon, can you talk to us about um, the resistance in Korea? What did the Japanese colonizers face there? The resistance to Japanese encroachment in the late 19th century took various forms. Eventually, they became organized in these smaller groups that campaigned in a kind of guerrilla like fashion, and they took the name of these similar guerrilla groups from the late. 16th century, the last time the Japanese invaded, um, which I guess in Korea was something that was never going to be forgotten and always at the forefront of memory and sentiment regarding Japan. And so this moniker of righteous army 
referred to these guerrilla campaigns against the Japanese military and the Japanese presence as a whole, beginning in the 1890s and all the way up to and even past the annexation of 1910. Uh, and then once you get into the 19 teens, uh, the armed resistance movement, which was mostly snuffed out in Korea by 1911, 1912, really was headquartered in China and especially in Manchuria. And uh, from there, you had various groups uh, rising up and organizing themselves into campaigns that attacked uh, Japanese positions in Manchuria as well as in Northern Korea. Uh, and this eventually developed into something larger in the 1920s and 30s. And then in, uh, it, during the wartime period between 1938 and 1945, uh, various groups of armed Korean resistance fighters arose in alliance with Chinese led campaigns in Manchuria and in greater China of various ideological or political stripes. And among them was this one guerrilla band that was led by this guy named Kim Il-sung, which happened not to be completely decimated by the Japanese hunt for these groups. And Kim Il-sung fled to uh, Russia, Siberia in 1940, was it was 41, uh, to ride out the rest of the war. But that became the basis of this extraordinarily fabricated, inflated story of Kim Il-sung becoming essentially the liberator of Korea. And that is not just a historical fabrication, of course, it becomes the legitimating narrative for the North Korean state. I and mean, that's still the case today. It's the most important and central narrative among various fabricated narratives from history in North Korea. That brings us to the post-colonial period. Kyung Moon, you might as well continue for us. Um, what happened after the departure of Japan, the defeat of Japan? Well, liberation informally took place on the day of the Japanese surrender, maybe even at the moment of the Japanese emperors coming on the radio and saying, we surrender. That was the moment of liberation uh, for Korea. And Almost immediately, within a few weeks, that liberation turned into another occupation when the two main allied forces of the United States and the Soviet Union came in to occupy the peninsula. Uh, of course, having seen Korea as simply an extension of Japan, uh, one of the great historical injustices that the Koreans look back on in referring to this period is that they were considered part of Japan and yet Japan, which was the real enemy of the Allied forces, itself was not divided. It was occupied completely by the United States. So why did Korea suffer this divided occupation, which led to the division of the nation itself into what we have today of North and South Korea? Anyway, uh, what you have arising in Korea is a pro-Soviet communist government that turned into a formal state in 1948 in the North and in the South, a pro-American right-wing government. Uh, and those two countries existed in tenuous form and in a very tense relationship until finally, in June of 1950, uh, the Northern forces under Kim Il-sung invaded the South and began the Korean War, which was at heart a Korean civil war with, of course, the geopolitical forces on both sides supporting the persecution of this war. And it resulted in, in, of course, terrible outcomes. And perhaps the most terrible is that it didn't really solve anything in terms of the national division. All of this is firmly connected to the reality of the colonial experience. If you didn't have the Japanese colonial rule, you wouldn't have had what ensued after 1945. Lewis, why was Taiwan handed over to China, which was then governed by the Kuomintang or KMT, instead of being granted independence? Uh, in 1943, during World War II, the Soviet Union and the Allies, the Americans and the Free French and the British, uh, met with their ally, the Republic of China government under Chiang Kai-shek, to discuss the post-war division of territory. And it was agreed without any consultation with the populace in Taiwan that Taiwan would come under the authority of the Republic of China. And so in 1945, this was put into effect. And I think it's generally felt that the departure of the Japanese was not a matter of great regret for the Taiwan population, which was worn out by the war. People in Taiwan 
as a majority had an ancestral connection to the Chinese mainland, even though they had not experienced the Republic of China at any stage, because the entity that they were taken out of in 1895 was the Qing dynasty. All of these contributed to a sense of, well, we will accede to this new arrangement, partly because they had no choice, and perhaps also because, well, people in Taiwan were used to being moved around in the in the world uh, power system. But the consequences of this, of course, were that a poor and battered Republic of China took over an area that, while itself had undergone a lot of damage in the later years of the war, was the most developed area in East Asia outside of Japan itself. And so the Republic of China government had weak and corrupt military system that took over and from 1945 through to 1946, essentially slightly more than a year, tensions increased between the Taiwan population and the incoming forces. So the Japanese language was banned, for example, and Mandarin was instituted as the language of public affairs. And of course, most people on Taiwan at that stage did not know Mandarin. They knew either Chinese languages, Aboriginal languages, and Japanese. So that put them out of any possible contention for positions in the incoming government. And the corruption, as I say, and desperation of the incoming forces led to a very high degree of tension with the local population. This led to a protest movement that emerged in the beginning of 1947 that was brutally repressed by the Guomindang government with the killing of a very significant component of the old Taiwan local elite and the imposition of strict military control over the island. The added complexity, of course, is that this is occurring at the time that the communists and the Guomindang, the Chinese nationalists, are competing for control of the Chinese mainland. This in 1948 and 1949 culminates in the defeat of the Guomindang of the Chinese nationalists and their government under Chiang Kai-shek evacuates to Taiwan, bringing with it around 2 million people from the old government structure who then proceed to set up a state with its own army, uh, with its own government apparatus, a state that claims to represent the government of China as a whole, and it exists with American backing. It's now thought that the Americans would perhaps have agreed to the annexation of Taiwan by the Chinese communists simply because they had no other choice until the breakout of the Korean War. And with the breakout of the Korean War in 1950, the Americans commit themselves to defending the government on Taiwan. So just to fast forward, what happens then in the 1950s and 1960s is a right wing dictatorship comes in for refugee government, a government in exile, establishes itself on Taiwan and proceeds to reshape Taiwan as an entity that is supposed to be what a free China will look like. And that government is committed to the idea of unification between Taiwan and the Chinese mainland with Taiwan as the center of that unification. So let's get this clear from the 1950s through to the 1980s, 1990s, the position, the official position of both the government in Beijing and the government in Taipei is that Taiwan and China are one structure separated as a result of a civil war, uh, and that one or other of them is going to win and reunify the group. But what emerges through this period is a sense on the part of the Taiwan population that this incoming government is, in a sense, a kind of further layer of colonization of the Taiwan island and a further subordination of Taiwan's people to the interests of an external power. So they are able to construct this incoming government in recent decades as a successor to the colonial regime of the Japanese. In other words, this incoming government is not a government of co-nationals, but it is rather a further colonial imposition upon Taiwan. So in that sense, one line in the narrative is that Taiwan has been constantly colonized and subordinated to external powers. And that is only in the recent past that Taiwan people have been, in a sense, self-governing. So that's the Taiwan independence nationalist 
position as opposed to the Chinese Guomindang unificatory nationalist position, which is that Taiwan and China are one structure. I'm going to rush us through to present day, if you like, with contemporary politics. And I'm dying to know, in terms of education, who decides the curriculum? How is the history of the colonial period taught? Let's start off in Korea, Kyung Moon. Well, uh, this became actually a point of political contention a few years ago uh, when um, the government of President Park Geun-hye decided to, after, what, two decades, to renationalize, or in other words, to take back control of the content of historical education in the public schools in order to counter what that government, supported by like-minded historians, considered to be the leftist takeover of the historical narrative. And so that was a major point of controversy, and it probably became a factor in the forces that ultimately led to that president being impeached and thrown out of office. Of course, there were other things were even more central to all of that. The point is that uh, the national history curriculum and the national historical narrative is a major point of contention, not only in terms of the content, which actually might be more uniform, but especially in terms of uh, how to narrate the larger storylines of modern history when it comes to not necessarily the colonial experience, although it's connected to that, but especially the experience thereafter, whether one should prioritize the ongoing striving for democratization or whether one should prioritize the economic development. Both strains, of course, have been central to uh, history of South Korea itself. The school teachers tend to be more progressive and they tend to be more nationalistic. Progressive in the sense that they emphasize the story of democratization, perhaps, over the story of economic development. And whether you are someone who favors one particular narrative over the other actually is related to how you look back on the colonial period. Those who are more to the right of center emphasize the economic miracle or the economic development of industrialization out of poverty in South Korean history. Uh, look back on the colonial period, uh, at least among the historians in this cohort, with a greater sense that the changes that took place in the colonial period did contribute ultimately to the larger modernization of Korea in the 20th century. Whereas if you're a more progressive persuasion and you emphasize the resistance to dictatorship in South Korean history and the striving for democracy, then you tend to look at the colonial period as more of a story of oppression and resistance to the oppression against the Japanese. Lewis, briefly, can you summarize how the history of that colonial period is taught in Taiwan? Because the post-1945 and particularly post-1949 government agenda was to demonstrate that Taiwan and China were one entity, the focus of the teaching of history from the 1950s through until the 1990s and even into the 2000s was on the history of China rather than on the history of Taiwan itself. And so when the martial law government, which was in force basically from the reunification of Taiwan with the motherland in 1945 all the way through to 1987, was in force, then this narrative about Taiwan as part of the history of China was emphasized, and that the Japanese colonization period was part of a separation of Taiwan from that history of the Chinese nation state as a whole. When that was challenged, I guess, as part of the process of democratization, the calling into question of authoritarian power, then one consequence of that was a rethinking of the Japanese colonial period as not simply a, a period of either of modernization or of colonial domination, but as something that made the Taiwan Han background majority population distinctive, that this was something that they shared. And so there was a kind of meditation on that history as a kind of cultural experience that Taiwan people who had histories on the island prior to 1945 had in common, and that post-1945 groups or the refugee group that had arrived from the mainland did not share, 
and that the process of, I suppose, establishing a democratic structure in which people located on Taiwan would, in a sense, determine their own government involved questioning the meaning of the Japanese colonial period as part and parcel of the establishment of a distinctive Taiwan identity and history. So a lot of this is to say, well, we no longer narrate Taiwan's history as part of China. We start on Taiwan with Taiwan's indigenous people and then talk about the waves of settlement and colonization that lead all the way up to the present. And how does mass media and social media, Lewis, influence public attitudes towards contemporary Japan? And I guess that's a particularly interesting question as we stand here in July 2022. Well, Taiwan, one can argue, is the first non-Japanese society to really experience the full force of modern Japanese popular culture. So the worldwide attraction that people now have to Japanese popular culture in all of its forms is something that Taiwan people experience early on, and I suppose is part and parcel of what makes their identity. So you don't feel there isn't the resistance perhaps on the part of many young people in Taiwan to Japanese popular culture that you sometimes can find in other parts of East Asia, in Korea and in the Chinese mainland, where enjoyment of things that come from Japan are seen as part and parcel of surrendering to Japanese colonization. That's not to say that that is completely absent in Taiwan, but it is less accented than it often is in Korea or the Chinese mainland. Kyung Moon, you were talking a little bit about this as we started this podcast, but perhaps you can say a little bit more about the social media and mass media influence, particularly towards attitudes towards Japan. Yeah, as with everything, it seems in South Korea, you have some kind of voice firmly entrenched in the sphere of social media especially YouTube. Um, and so you can hear a wide range of perspectives, even about something that you would think would be something more of a consensus, namely the pain perspective uh, or the victimized perspective, looking back on the colonial period. This includes those who say that this anti-Japanese sentiment born from that experience and even further back is either not accurate or is distorted or that it is no longer useful. In other words, that the South Koreans should move beyond that and embrace Japan as a fellow democracy, a liberal democracy within the sphere of military or geopolitical alliance under American leadership. Uh, and so that's not necessarily the, the most popular perspective, but it is a substantial perspective. And then you have all kinds of different inputs from historians who in South Korean media play an important role, which is something, you know, as a historian, <laughs> I would think is a good thing, uh, although it can get overboard a bit, I suppose. And I think historians' voices being expressed in these popular media forms usually result in not only more interesting information and facts, but also more nuanced perspectives and more complicated perspectives as well. Let's look at the situation that we're in today, mid-2022. I wonder, how does China's increasing assertiveness in the region affect South Korea's relationship with Japan, Kian Moon? It's complicated, I suppose. So you're dealing with historical connections and historical sentiments which might conflict with the reality of geopolitical alliances to, today as well. And, and when you're talking about these three countries, their historical connections date back thousands of years, not just hundreds of years, right? So all of that has accumulated and those roots inform the perspective on what happened in the 20th century and in the 21st century as well. So I'm sorry, I don't have a, a good answer for you aside from the fact that this is very complicated. Indeed, indeed. Lewis, I'm sure you'll have something to say on China's increasing assertiveness and, and how that affects uh, Japan's relationship with Taiwan. So because the loss of Taiwan is seen as the pivotal moment in the modern history of Chinese nationalism, and because the state in the People's Republic of China since the 1980s has been preoccupied with nationalist themes and presenting the government as an agent of national strengthening and national reunification. The separation of Taiwan from the mainland 
has this colossal role in the national narrative that the People's Republic of China is asserting. And so the official explanation is that the reason why Taiwan ceased to be part of China and is now a separate entity is explained as, well, that's Japanese colonization that's done that. And that actually recapitulates the narrative that the Chinese nationalists, the Kuomintang, had in the 1940s about why Taiwan was separated from China. So the Taiwan independence advocates, those who argue that Taiwan should be self-governing, internationally recognized state, are resistant most of all these days to that unificatory impulse from the mainland. And they see their own desire for independence as recapitulating that resistance to the unification attempt undertaken by the Republic of China in the 1940s, then Japan emerges as a kind of helpmate in ensuring that that subordination of Taiwan identity and Taiwan status to the People's Republic of China's agendas does not happen. So that may account both at a diplomatic level and at a popular level for a softening of memories of the colonial period, which, as we've explained earlier, are distinctive in some ways in the general sort of family of colonial identity stories. So that the idea that Japan is, in a sense, helping to preserve Taiwan's self-determination or even favouring it is something that, you know, certain forces in Taiwan are supportive of as a position. Oh, well, that's just been an absolutely fascinating discussion, which I've really enjoyed. Kyung Moon, Lewis, thank you so much for speaking to Ear to Asia. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Jane. Our guests have been Professor Kyung Moon Huang from Australian National University and Dr. Lewis Mayo from Asia Institute. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show. And do put in a good word for us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 4th of July, 2022. Producers were Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons Copyright 2022, the University of Melbourne. I'm Jane Hutchin. Thanks for your company.